Support for Knowledge Stream comes in part from a generous contribution provided by an anonymous donor. Yeah, yeah I've been a Toledo local for six months. Uh, I, I lived in New England once, and I was there for six years, and I was still not a local. <laughs> New, New England is that way. Um, so first of all, you see, I have two spray containers here. All right, and what I'd like to do is pass them around. I assure you that they are nothing but pleasant. They are not toxic in any way. And what I'd like you to do while I'm talking is pass these around, squirt them, and sniff the odor, okay? All right, and we'll explain why a little later. Just please make sure I get them back because I do this all the time and I need them. You can tell me what the chemistry is of that, okay? All right, how many of you have houseplants at home? Okay, do they do this on the screen? Yeah, well, they might. Not quite so fast, that's the point. <laughs> they probably do, but you didn't notice because they do it slowly. This is actually uh, near real time. This, this plant's particularly active. Um, but one of my goals today is to convince you that uh, plants are more than furniture. Uh, they have behaviors, they can do many of the kinds of things that animals do. In fact, I like to refer to them as merely very slow animals, <laughs> all right? Uh, now, I realize that you can make furniture from plants, of course. Uh, some people actually actively grow plants as furniture. Um, and, you know, typically, did anybody notice the plants in the uh, hallway out there yes. coming in? Yes. All right, some of you did. How many did? Okay, oh, you're, you're, you're paying attention. Usually when I ask that question, people say, no, I didn't notice the plants, and that's because the plants are just standing there. People kind of ignore them. They walk by them as though they're part of the furniture. Um, but one point of this talk is going to be to illustrate how behavior-like plants behave, okay? It's not surprising that we think of them uh, as static organisms because, after all, they are rooted in the ground. Uh, they don't seem to go any place, uh, but that leads to a real need to be able to do things where they're standing. Uh, if you think about it, if plants don't like where they are, they don't have the opportunity to jump out and move to a new place. Uh, although some of them sort of do that, I'll show you in a minute. Uh, but generally speaking, they're stuck in one place. So that means they have to be able to see, hear, and smell what's going on around them. Uh, and they can do all those things. Uh, now we're familiar with a lot of very animal-like uh, behaviors by plants. Uh, whoops. A lot of animal-like behaviors by plants. I want to go back. Yeah, okay. Let's get this. Uh, a lot of us, you know, know the dramatic movements of plants that eat insects and other things. The Venus flytrap is very famous. Uh, but, you see this Venus flytrap? That's an animal. All right, so, and it behaves essentially the same way. It's a sea anemone. Um, and it is an animal, and boy, if that isn't a Venus flytrap, I don't know what is, right? So talk about being animal-like. There's a really easy to see one. This is actually called the Venus flytrap anemone, so, so people recognize that. Here's another one. Uh, we probably actually have this one and the last one growing here in Ohio, um, a sundew which grows on soils that are kind of lacking in nitrogen. And a great place to get nitrogen is from an insect. Lots of protein there. And by the way, you know, a lot of people in the world eat insects because they're so protein rich. Uh, and if the soil's low in nitrogen, then the plant has to get it somewhere. And these kinds of plants get them from, from animals. This is a plant that's common in the water here uh, in Northwest Ohio. Uh, and it's in the business of capturing small copepods in the water and uh, it gets a tasty shot of protein and nitrogen that way. So <clears throat> plants are out there to get the nitrogen, protein, and other things that they need one way or another. And one way, way they can do it is by behaving like animals. Lots of people are standing in the back. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. A bunch of chairs down here and I don't bite. So come on down. Plants also do behaviors to get their seeds around. Uh, and some of their behaviors to do this are pretty spectacular. 
Uh, if, if you watch these, some of these are probably familiar plants to you. Boom. Anybody know what this is? Impatience. Impatience, another name for it? Touch me not. Touch me not, and that's why. <laughs> Explosive dispersal of seeds. Why would plants want to throw their seeds around like this? Well, yeah, uh, they want to get away from mom, essentially. <laughs> this is, this is my, my favorite, this spiny, spiny cucumber <laughs> really does it. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> okay. <coughs> now, a lot of animals don't spread their propagules around that way. <coughs> Excuse me, but that's pretty behavioral, don't you think? And here's one everybody knows. Sensitive plant, I guess. You know, and nobody's actually figured out what the benefit is to this plant of doing that. And we know a lot about how it works, but exactly why it's doing that isn't clear to anybody. Uh, and then we were talking about plants, you know, getting around. Uh, vines in particular are designed to be light seekers, to get out of the shade. That's the way they make their living. And to do that, <coughs> many of them, and this is Parthenocissus, a common vine here, uh, have developed little feet to grasp the surface that they're climbing on. Uh, the, the foot actually develops a, a, a surface on the bottom that grips the bark of the tree in this case. Uh, and they're very finger-like. In fact, they are very much like gecko feet. In fact, the bottom is very much designed like a gecko foot. And of course, geckos are famous for being able to climb on any surface. So here we go. We've got you know, animal feet. We've got uh, animal hunting. Uh, and then we have movements around to look for a good place to hang on to. Uh, the technical term for doing this is called nutation. Uh, it just means twirling around until you hit something and find it. Uh, there's a whole science to how the plant knows that it has touched something and, and forms the, the little uh, uh, gripping activity there. Um, but doesn't that remind you of some animals? Uh. Yeah. Of course, we could have used the monkey's tail. Could have used lots of things here. Um, but there are lots of parallels anyway. Uh, I'm not saying that these have all evolved in the same way or anything, but plants have to accomplish many of the things that animals do, uh, and they've developed ways of doing all those things. But most of what plants do is much less visible than what I've just shown you. Those are really conspicuous easy to see things, particularly if you have a slow motion camera, okay? Uh, most of what plants do is actually chemical. <coughs> and this is a, depicture, a picture of our interaction with plant chemistry. Um, we have aspirin there on the left, which um, comes originally from willow bark. Uh, Native Americans used to chew willow bark uh, to alleviate pain. Uh, and that's because the bark of willow trees contains a chemical called salicylic acid. And uh, Dr. Bayer realized that there must be a good pain reliever there, modified salicylic acid a little bit to make acetosalicylic acid, which is aspirin. And in fact, a huge fraction of the drugs we commonly use originated as plant chemistry that we have modified for our own uses. Uh, speaking of modifying for our own uses, or at least taking advantage of this, how many of you had coffee this morning? Yeah. Why did you have coffee this morning? Stimulant. Stimulant. Wakes you up, right? The reason for that, the reason it works that way, is that the molecule caffeine <coughs> looks to your central nervous system just like a signal your central nervous system normally uses to keep you awake. You probably know that signals in the nervous system are transmitted between neuron cells by chemical trans transfer. And the chemical that's, uh, that's used for keeping you awake in that part of your brain looks just like the caffeine molecule. Now you have to ask the question, why would coffee plants make a neurotransmitter? I mean, they don't have brains. They don't have central nervous systems. They don't have nerves at all. Why in the world are they making something that does that? Any ideas? Stay awake, no, they, <laughs> they don't have that system. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, no, they were doing this long before they were humans, so it's not to benefit us. Yeah. 
It's just the opposite. It's an insecticide. Uh, caffeine is also one of the most bitter compounds on the planet. So most things don't want to eat plants with caffeine in them. Uh, and if you're, you know, for us, it's amusing to get a little dose of caffeine, but that little dose of caffeine, if you're a caterpillar, is horrible. It really ties up your nervous system, and it's actually deadly. Uh, same thing is true of nicotine. Um, nicotine is one of the world's oldest insecticides. It has been used for centuries by humans. Just grinding up uh, nicotine, and you can make a really nice uh, insecticide from it. Uh, and it acts in a similar way. It's a stimulant. Uh, it's also habit forming. Uh, and in its original use in nature, it's deadly to insects. Uh, let's see. Oh, we have a red wine up there. Uh, a red wine, which is never truly great unless it has a certain tannin content. Tannins are a kind of chemical that many plants make that are used to keep your belt from rotting. Uh, if we didn't treat leather with tannins, they would be di your leather would be digested by bacteria and fungi in, in a matter of days. Uh, people who work in the tropics and uh, <clears throat> where it's very humid and fungi abound uh, find that if they use improperly tanned leather goods, they disappear in about a month. Uh, so that's something else we've, uh, we've come to use and uh, enjoy even. Whoops, I had one more I wanted to do. Was it? Yeah, okay. And then spices. <clears throat> the reason we have spices and love the flavor is that they're loaded with these kinds of odd chemicals that protect plants, the plants they came from, from diseases, pathogens of various sorts, fungi, insects, but we have first used them as preservatives and secondly developed a taste for them. So pretty much anything that's a spice that you like uh, has a chemistry that started off as some way of protecting the original plant from its enemies. So we have an intimate and important relationship with the chemistry of plants. It's been very important in human history for a long time. Uh, here's the example of nicotine. As you can see, you can still buy nicotine sulfate, which is uh, usually as a dust as an important insecticide. Uh, and it, it works really well because, you know, only a couple of things can eat tobacco plants. They're sp highly specialized so they can tolerate nicotine. But for the most part, 99% of the world can't stand a tobacco plant. And people really shouldn't either. But. Okay. Now, along the way, we discovered, uh, uh, along with some other scientists, that <clears throat> while plants have this chemistry innately in them, Plants also have a behavior which is to increase the concentrations of those chemicals when attacked by things. So if we have a tobacco plant on the left and a caterpillar comes along and, and eats part of our, our tobacco plant, what happens is the plant begins to produce higher concentrations of nicotine and that gets rid of the pest and the plant is better protected. Now, how would we know that how would we know that that's actually happening to do an experiment? What kind of experiment could we design to know that this happened? Well, you have to have a plant that you like put a caterpillar on, right? Okay. How do you know that it changed? Well, you got to measure something before and after or put another insect on. But in any experiment like that, we need something we call a control, right? We're making the same measurements on plants that are not being attacked by our caterpillar. Okay, so we've done lots of experiments like that and it turns out that we discovered that if the control plants are growing right next to the plant we put the caterpillar on, the control plant also changes its chemistry as though it's being eaten. Hmm, Th that first of all makes it difficult to do an experiment. And in fact, this discovery has ruined a lot of people's research programs because if you're going to do this kind of experiment, your plants have to be very far apart and they, they can't be near each other at all. So it really makes doing an experiment uh, more difficult. Now, I'm showing you potted plants here, so they're not connected in any way. They're not touching each other. So how does that work? Well, somehow <coughs> it appears that some warning is going from one plant to the other. It can't be through the soil because they're in pots, okay? But if you put a barrier in the air between the two plants, this stops. If you separate the plants by enough distance or you put uh, some kind of barrier that keeps airflow from moving between the two plants, bingo, the control plant does not change. <coughs> um, I'm going to skip that one. Okay. So what that means is all the plants in this field 
uh, are experiencing what their neighbors experience by something that moves through the air. Uh, th this discovery of talking plants uh, happened about in, in the early 80s. It was instantly popular with the press. The, uh, the first place, that, uh, we were the discoverers of this, and the first place that covered our work was the National Enquirer. <laughs> well, at the time, I didn't know enough to ask the reporter who he worked for, so. Okay, but you can assume that every plant in this field is experiencing some reaction on the part of its neighbors. In fact, anything a plant experiences causes this change in odor production and the movement of these molecules through the air. Those molecules are of lots of familiar types. <coughs> uh, in fact, who's smelled the, uh, the can going around? Yes. What did it smell like? Leather. Hmm? Cinnamon. Cinnamon. Leather. 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 All right, it's, it's actually the odor of jasmine flowers. No. And uh, it's a perfume. That's where I got that, okay? Uh, the odor of jasmine flowers is one of the most popular and most common components in perfumes because everybody likes it uh, and because it uh, jingles your nose at really low concentrations. You don't need very much of it for people to sense it. Uh, that molecule is called methyl jasminate, named after the jasmine flowers. Uh, and it's one of the molecules thrown into the air by plants that are being disturbed uh, in any way. Um, the odor of wintergreen is caused by another relative of that salicylic acid I mentioned, methyl salicylate. Uh, the odor of wintergreen can be used to turn on plant defenses against diseases. That's a signal to plants that they are being attacked by viruses or bacteria. So almost anything that you've smelled in nature uh, arising from plants some of which you probably enjoy and, and take from, actually is a hormone used by plants to change their behavior in response to a threat uh, or any other thing that happens to them in the environment. So what that means is when you mow your lawn and you smell that, that's actually your grass calling for help. <laughs> um, <laughs> vegans in particular don't like this story. <laughs> Uh, because it, you know, it gives plants a lot of attributes that we would like to avoid. Um, uh, but, but this is the case. In fact, the, the chemistry of that has been pr pretty well worked out and it indeed is related to uh, wounding the plants. <coughs> There's another function for this. <coughs> when insects attack a plant, that changes the odor the plant is emitting. So as our caterpillars eat here, you see the color representation of the odors changes. That is attractive to other insects that want to eat the caterpillar. Oh, nice. The number of caterpillars or insect pests in the world is controlled by a couple of different things. One of them is the chemistry we're talking about because not all plants are easy to eat. But the other is these kinds of enemies, little, mainly little wasps that are hunting pest insects. Think about finding a pest insect in a big field. It's got to be a hard job. Well, this wasp used the signal from the plant to find the caterpillar. So essentially what plants are doing is calling in help, calling in bodyguards by emitting odors that say, over here, right here is where lunch is. Uh, this turns out to be a very important thing. Among other things, uh, you can demonstrate that plants that can do that are better protected than plants that aren't. This is a picture of a wild tobacco plant that has been genetically modified so that it can't emit volatiles. Uh, and what's happened here is that the tobacco hornworms are devouring the whole plant because nobody has come along to save the plant. Okay, so plants really depend on this, on this uh, ability to call in bodyguards as an important way of preserving their safety. Okay, so um, are we talking about just communicating through the air? Uh, no, as a matter of fact. Um, <clears throat> First of all, we'd like to know what some of this stuff is and uh, how it works. And to do that, our laboratory uses this kind of uh, odor extraction kind of uh, device where filtered air is run past the plant. Some of the plants here have been chewed by caterpillars and some not. Uh, <clears throat> and that air is sampled and sophisticated chemistry, analytical chemistry uh, instrumentation is used to identify those chemicals. The reason we have to do it this way is that all of the signals I'm talking about here are flying through the air at very low concentrations. It's very hard for us to, to, to see them. That, that jasmine sample that we're passing around the room, that's highly concentrated. 
Okay, it's nothing like that in nature. So uh, we have to use this kind of uh, apparatus to figure out that plants are doing this. Uh, that's kind of a problem because we'd really like to know how this works outdoors and that's very, very difficult to do and I'm not sure anybody has really done it successfully. So just through the air, no. Um, oh, well, yeah, just through the air, okay. Another thing plants can do is they can tell who's attacking them. So if our plant in the center here is attacked by this caterpillar, it emits a set of odors that are spe specific to and characteristic of being attacked by that species of caterpillar. But if a second species of caterpillar attacks the same plant, the plant emits a different set of odors specific to that caterpillar. One reason that that's particularly useful to the plants is that different parasites are hunting for different caterpillar species. So the odors emitted in response to one caterpillar attract the enemies of that caterpillar but the odors emitted in response to a second caterpillar species are attractive to the enemies of that caterpillar species. So plants have very sophisticated taste abilities here. They are able to tell one species of attacker from another and they do the same thing with bacteria and fungi and various kinds of diseases. They can tell those apart as well. Uh, <coughs> plants can use these uh, odors in a different way as well. I, we mentioned already plants growing on poor soils that that take advantage of the nice protein and nitrogen content by, of insects by eating them. Some plants are parasitic on other plants. This is a plant called dotter. It's a parasite on other plants. Uh, it makes nothing of its own. It doesn't photosynthesize. It's not green. And it really depends on finding a host plant and sucking it dry by invading the stems and actually sucking out the nutrients of that plant uh, just, just as a parasite would. But it has this problem. The seeds are scattered around. They're in the soil. The seeds germinate and then they have to find a host plant. Now this, this particular kind of parasite can actually attack a lot of different kinds of host plants but it still has to find one. So you have this little tiny seed from which is emerging a little tiny vine. What's it going to do to find a host plant? Well, here's what it does. That's our vine baby starting out. There we go. Oh, here we go. Okay. There it is, starting to grow. It's looking. It's looking. It's looking for a tomato plant to parasitize. Keep trying. If it doesn't do this successfully in about a day, it's dead. Ah. We found it. If you do this experiment, just like the one I just showed you, and you put glass between the tomato plant and the vine, it fails to find the tomato plant. If you do this experiment and you show the, uh, the vine, the, the parasite, a picture of a tomato plant, it doesn't find that. But if you take the odor of a tomato plant and put it on a cork, the, the parasitic vine finds the cork right away. So this is a case in which the parasitic plant is using one of these odor signals from a host plant to find it and attack it. It's really pretty clever, don't you think? Yeah, that's pretty amazing, I think. Uh, how about uh, transmission through the soil? Well, <coughs> uh, some of you probably know that one response that plants have to drought is that they close the little openings called stomates on their seeds through which they exchange air with the environment. The reason they do that, of course, is that when those openings are open, water is escaping from the plant. So to conserve water, plants close off their interaction with the atmosphere to, to save the water. So if we fail to water our plant, uh, you get the typical response which is one of the first things it does is it closes these openings. Okay, that's fine. Uh, obviously, if we water a plant happily, uh, its stomates are open, which you can see there. But what I'm showing you here is an experiment in which <coughs> the plant on the left is not attached to the plant in the center, but the plant on the right is attached to the plant in the center only by soil. Okay, so they're in a common soil uh, zone. The plant on the right is watered, so it's happy. The plant in the center is the one that we're depriving of water. It's unhappy. What happens to the plant, the happy plant on the right, is it closes its stomates as though we failed to water it. 
Uh, you can do a lot of experiments here to show that some signal is passing from the roots of the unwatered plant to the roots of the watered plant to cause it to behave as though it's not been watered. We don't know what that signal is yet. You can do lots of experiments changing the soil and all sorts of things, but we know there's something there, but we don't know what it is yet. Uh, here's another way of looking at that. Whoops, oh, there we go. Here's another way of looking at that. If, if we grow a pea plant in a pot of soil and we put aphids on it, the pea plant will become repellent to aphids. It, do, it, it does all the things I'm talking about. It makes more of its defenses. It turns on its signals to call in enemies, does the whole routine. Uh, so that plant is now repellent and protected against aphids. If we take another plant, we take our first plant out of the soil and we put a second plant into the soil, guess what happens? It becomes repellent. This plant has never been touched by aphids. It has experienced nothing unpleasant. Uh, and yet, just growing it in the same soil as a plant that has responded to enemies turns it on as though it had been exposed to enemies. And again, we don't really know what the signals are in the soil here yet. Uh, it's really, actually, it, it's tough enough to find the signals in open air. It's particularly tough to find it in soil, which is a complex mixture of lots of chemistry, so it's difficult to do. Now, in the cases I just showed you, the connection between the plants is chemical. Something must be moving through the soil to turn on number, plant number two when plant number one responds. But many, if not most, plants are actually physically connected to each other by fungus strains, strands, okay? Uh, if you look at this picture, <coughs> there's a, uh, these are three pine seedlings. You see the one in the middle is bigger than the other two. And the only part of that plant that is actually root is the yellow part. Everything else in the picture are strands of fungus. These fungi are uh, symbiotic. They attach themselves to the plant and help the plant, tra the, the roots travel further to find more nutrients. It's very common uh, among many plants. Uh, <clears throat> and so you can see that the, the extension of the roots if you include the, the fungus strands here, uh, is much greater than it would be if it were just roots. If you were to look at this very, very carefully, you would discover that many of those fungal strands are connected between the three plants. So in reality, these three plants are actually share a root system, but the root systems are connected by fungi, not by the roots themselves. What that means is, in a forest like this one, which actually this is the oak openings, you can pretty much assume that most of the plants in that picture are actually communicating with each other through their roots. So if tree number one is experiencing something that changes its chemistry in some way, uh, it's highly likely that the tree next to it is receiving signals that tell us something about what's going on. And that can even be true for the plants on, on the uh, forest floor. Uh, something that's interesting and you can notice is that uh, one of the, uh, the kinds of fungus that is most commonly uh, growing this way is uh, russula. If you see this, this um, <coughs> uh, mushroom in the forest, uh, you can assume that that is the fruiting body of the fungi that are connecting the trees in the forest. Some other plants have developed the ability to parasitize this relationship. These plants don't photosynthesize. They don't do anything for themselves. Instead, they plug into the fungus network among the trees and make their living that way. And uh, some pretty famous plants here, orchids, uh, are making their living that way. That orchid is uh, using its roots to tap into the tree's fungus connections. That all makes sense? Is that crazy? Yeah, yeah. So what's happening out there is a conversation among plants. <clears throat> Both below ground, some of it purely chemical, and some of it real connections below ground. Then above ground, uh, every time a plant experiences something, it begins to emit signals that other plants nearby can respond to. Uh, I've been highlighting responses to insects here, but almost anything a plant experiences uh, produces an odor bouquet that is specific to that, exper that experience. So a drought stress produces a different set of, of signals than an insect does, for example. So it's a conversation going on. Uh, as I said a moment ago, this, uh, this discovery originally got a lot of attention. And you know that your work is really breaking through when bad movies are made from it. 
Uh, uh, this movie, The Happening, uh, which I do not urge you to run out and watch, okay, uh, is based on our work, uh, except that the, the director decided that the signals that the plants would emit would influence people to commit suicide. That was the basis of this, this, uh, this movie. So it was important to get home before the plants sent you and start <laughs> emitting, okay. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, I, I saw the director interview and he said, oh, I was reading these papers about how plants communicate and, and through the air and stuff, and I thought, oh, he must have read our papers, that's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, so can we use any of this stuff? I mean, is this useful in some way? Well, <clears throat> you remember I said a moment ago that each plant emits an odor bouquet specific to the problem it's facing. Uh, if you are a farmer and you have a field of wheat or corn or soybeans, you're interested in trying to stop insect pest problems before they get started very much. And what you typically do is you hire, usually high school students, to go up and down your rows looking for insects, uh, keeping track of the number seen, and if the number gets above some value, you spray the entire field. And you do that over and over again. And what happens to those insecticides that are sprayed over and over again? Where do they wind up? In the Maumee, in the, and in the Maumee River, okay? What if you could just identify where the insects are and only treat them right there? That's called precision agriculture. And one way you could do that is to equip uh, robotic vehicles with a nose, a mechanical nose that's capable of finding plants that are experiencing an insect problem, checking the chemistry of the odors against some standard, and then treating only that spot. This kind of spot treatment would save millions of dollars and lots of environmental harm uh, if you could develop such a thing. Uh, we have gotten to the point uh, with an engineering collaborator of uh, developing a device that's about the size of a shoebox that might be able to do this, uh, but we'll be taking up a collection at the end because we've run out of money to keep this going. <laughs> so, so we don't know if, if it'll work for this yet. But there are other interesting applications. First of all, what I just showed you about finding pests can be used in greenhouses where it's a much, much easier to do. Um, but something you don't think about is if you're a greenhouse owner growing tomatoes, and by the way, Northwest Ohio is one of the largest greenhouse tomato producers in the country, how do you know when to pick them? Well, this is a standard way. You have a set of colors and you go by the color, okay? But it turns out that as fruits of any kind ripen, the odors they emit change. And there's a, there's a specific combination of odors that indicate that the fruit is ripe. So what you could do here, instead of this gentleman trying to decide is this red enough to pick, uh, is to use a mechanical device that goes up and down the rows and decides which tomatoes are ready to be picked, okay? Would that work? Well, it hasn't been worked out for tomatoes, but it has for grapes. The, uh, the upper left graph here shows you um, the ability to, uh, of, of vision to separate four sets of grapes on the basis of their age. And you can see they, they overlap a lot. It's really hard to tell, say, the blue group from the green group from the, from the orange group. And that's because uh, the color of a fruit is only an approximation of its ripeness. Uh, for those of you who shop at the store for um, melons, how do you select a ripe melon? Well, you thump it, but what else? You smell it, okay? The lower right picture is the, the result of identifying the ripeness of grapes on the basis of their odor. And you can see it's really easy to separate them. You can really tell them apart. Uh, vineyard owners are very interested in a device that would allow them to more precisely age their grape uh, bunches because when you harvest a grape is the key to the price of the wine you can sell from those grapes. Ripeness is a critically important value. There are other ag agricultural applications of this kind of thing. Uh, some people have set up a, what is a pretty successful agricultural program in Africa in which the, the crop plants are mixed uh, in a way that, um, that some of them are repellent to certain insects, 
Others are, are attracted to other insects, all based on these odors. So between your corn plants, you plant plants that emit an odor that repel pests. Uh, elsewhere, you plant plants that are attractive to the enemies of the pests. This is called push-pull agriculture. And so far, <coughs> excuse me, it's worked pretty well in Africa. But as you can see, you have to intercrop different kinds of plants. You can't have a single plant growing all by itself. Uh, so industrial agriculture, as it's done in North America, really isn't very friendly to this approach. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me, summing up on all this. When you look at a field like this, everybody looks happy. Everybody looks like furniture. I mean, they're not doing anything unless the wind is blowing, right? But actually, every plant in the picture <coughs> has connections going on between its roots and fungi searching for better nutrients. Each plant, or many of the plants in the picture, are connected to other plants and exchanging signals that way. Any of the plants that are stressed in any way are sending signals through the air that the other plants around it can perceive. Um, they're doing all kinds of crazy behavioral stuff. It's just that most of it is chemical and it's hard to see. So placid as though that picture looks, there's a lot going on that we just don't see. And a lot of it, if you think about it, is not that different from what animals have to do to make a living. So <coughs> uh, much of the research I've shown you here done in our lab uh, has been supported by the National Science Foundation and the Department of Defense. Uh, and my frequent collaborator on this is Heidi Apple, Dr. Heidi Apple, who is uh, Dean of the Honors College here at UT. Uh, we're very grateful for the financial support, of course, as well as her, her help. Our daughter appreciates her help, too. Uh, and if you're interested in her contribution to this kind of thing, here's, here's what's happening next month. Uh, Heidi will be giving a talk on another communication stream that plants use. That is the ability to hear their enemies consuming them. Uh, that'll be out at the Lake Erie Center in, on April 19th, and I urge you to attend. She's a very entertaining speaker. So you all got that if you want it? Okay. Thanks very much. Support for Knowledge Stream comes in part from a generous contribution provided by an anonymous donor.